Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to a brand new After Dinner Mint series titled Behind the Code. On the show, we welcome Art Blocks artists to share a deeper look into their projects, creative coding, and process. Today, we welcome Alex and Steven, who together make the duo Generative Artworks as they discuss their project, Democracy. Welcome, guys. I'll let you take it from here. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for the introduction. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in and uh, checking out our deep dive into Democracy. Um, so we'll jump right in and we're going to take a look at Empyrean. <laughs> so um, Empyrean was our first release on Artblocks. Um, and uh, what we wanted to cover here is that you can see in this, like from this algorithm, Empyrean has pretty much just like pure randomness. Um, all we did for Empyrean really is take a bunch of points around a circle and then connect them randomly. Um, there are some other features um, that aren't shown here, but that's really the basic algorithm. And what we wanted to do after that with Enchiridion was rather than just choosing like pure randomness, we wanted to really um, write a, a more in-depth algorithm that really enforced its rules um, and showed more rigidity. So here you can see Enchiridion. What we did differently here was uh, we used rectangular subdivision. Um, so you start off with this outer shape, just a large square, and you subdivide it into smaller rectangles. Um, so you can see all of the, the rectangles inside. Um, the way this works is from the outer rectangle, you would split that once. So let's say maybe it split right here down the center line. Um, and then from there, you would have two smaller rectangles on the left and right of that center line, and it continues to split recursively until a certain condition is met. So um, the reason this relates to democracy is we used this same algorithm from Enchiridion and modified it. Um, so democracy is basically just rectangular subdivision layered on top of itself several times. So if you were to look here at an example of a democracy, um, so I just set the view to be uh, like a bird's eye view of this, it's pretty much an Enchiridion. So you could see a lot of similarities between how the, the um, rectangles are created and the different sections are there. Um, it starts with the same large outer square. This one probably also split down the middle to begin with and then the left and right sides were split from there. Um, but the main difference here is that now you can see we have streets. Um, so Democracy is using the same algorithm from Enchiridion, but in a different way, rather than just using it to create new shapes that are grouped next to each other, we're using it to create um, sort of emulations of real world city elements. So the, the first largest one is the streets here. Um, and so once you, if, if you were to look at New York city, there are a few like main elements or any city. Um, so every city has streets and, um, once those streets are there in between the streets are city blocks and then city blocks are broken up into different buildings. Um, so you could see like, let's take this for example, here we have streets around here and then there's this block in between those streets. And then on that block, there are buildings. And then lastly, each building has different levels. So we can take this one right here, for example. Um, here's one level, two, three, four, five, and we keep going up and creating additional levels. Um, so the, the overall theme here is that what we did to create this 3D city is we took our Enchiridion rectangular subdivision algorithm and just kept layering it enough times to create an entire city. Yeah, and what's super interesting, like a bit of this was actually a mistake. It was like, while we were making Enchiridion, I think we were about like a month, uh, two months into it. Mm -hmm. And we, I was looking at it one day and I was like, I was wondering what, what an Enchiridion would look like in 3D. So I brought the like similar code into Blender, which we were using at the time to do like plotter pieces. 
um, like take like uh, like edge detection in order to get like an SVG out of a 3D object and then you know plot it. And so I brought it in there and ran the code and I was like, wow, this is really close to city generation. Mm -hmm. Uh, and city generation is actually something we've been really interested in for a long time. So it kind of really played into our avenue and it, it, it opened up this whole thing. So we finished in Caridian and explored that topic, but we kind of had this next topic lined up that we'd been thinking about um, mm -hmm. for, you know, eight, nine months. And then finally we had, we had kind of like that tool to use. I think what's also really interesting about these algorithms in particular is it's, it's extremely rigid. It's it's these rules that are you're just taking a rectangle and subdividing it, and you're able to kind of have this system of rules that create cities um, from a very simple um, kind of rule set. Mm -hmm. So we're going to kind of go into the code now and talk a bit about uh, like what are those rules, and so what what did we kind of I guess, what variables did we play with? So when we code, we try to pull out um, the rule sets. So you have like the sequences, which is we're like, oh, you, you make the blocks and then, well, you make the streets, then you make the, you know, the blocks and then you make the buildings and then you make the levels for those buildings. Like that is, you know, the sequence. But the rules are actually the, like, how do you do each of those things? And what are the variables that influence that? So first thing we have is we have that street generation. And this is, you have a bunch of different types of street generation for each different type of city. So you have the traditional street generation, the agro-industrial street generation, the monolith, the bigger in center, and so on and so forth. And you'll notice a few big variables here being the split width chance, the split depth chance, the split repeat chance, the split choices, and the number of repetitions X and the number uh, repetitions Y. So split width chance is where, like how often will I like split like in the width direction? Like what's the chance I do that? And then split depth is what's the chance of the other direction? And then split repeat is actually you take those streets and you like of that of whatever level it was at while dividing them and then repeat that across. So that's how you get like if you look at a democracy and you see like a grid, like a perfect grid, that's because it hit like this split repeat chance and it decided like, OK, the roads are going to be repeated. And like the this is like the choices. So it can either split on like a fourth a half or 0.75, so a third. And that's just so it, it kind of has this pattern to it versus if you always split randomly, none of the roads will line up, which doesn't make a lot of sense to, uh, you know, when you're building a city, you're going to try to make your roads like line up, you know, because if you don't, like no one's going to, like driving around that city is going to be a big pain. Right. And I think we have a good example of that. Uh, for chaos, you can see the split choices are all over the place. Um, and we'll show an example of a chaos at some point. Um, but it, you can see like by keeping it so consistent, we have that nice organization and then using this um, set of rules or the, these configurations that we pulled out from the actual execution of the algorithm, we can change one of these things and totally change the way the output looks. Yeah. And then number of petitions X here only happens if it was a split repeat chance. That's just like how many times it'll like possibly repeat itself, like the max amount of times, because like some will have like, I think the only one that there's like only in terms of streets, I don't think any of them have more. Maybe there's one, but that's just like gives us the ability to be like, OK, this is a um like this should have like this is a type of city that would have more repetitions um like so it, it gives us that ability to kind of try to understand each different type of city through like the lens of its rules versus like oh i have to make a sequence every single time we try to abstract all the sequence away so we can think about the overarching rules and then at some points we may go in and be like oh like this is a rule that i don't have ability to do in my sequence right now and then we'll go in and try to implement that sequence enough that it's abstracted so we can then play with that. So democracy is really, it tries to abstract away everything so we can kind of come from that angle and
the sequencing and now you're trying to tell us story the street generation and you'll actually see this when we say like it's three different layers of in Caribbean, you'll see these variables repeat on like the other levels that we're talking about. So this is street. Next, we're going to go to like block splitting. So making like the plots of land that buildings will be built on. And you're going to see this again. And each one of the different um, like the different ones has, uh, you know, has different ways that it calculates these variables. Like some may be influenced by how close it is to the center. Uh, for example, like a bigger and center uh, uses the, oh, does it not? Doesn't it use an X and Z? Maybe, okay. Yeah, I guess it doesn't. <laughs> yeah, taking a look at its code month later, but you'll see in different ones, they'll be influenced by different variables that are passed in, uh, such as like the width and depth here uh, is influencing uh, the split part. Actually, yeah, that's what it is, width, width and depth. Uh, for this one. Um, yeah, and I think we have an example of the. Oh, no, we don't. Never mind. <laughs> what is the next one? Ah, we'll get to that. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to go into the block split uh, chances, which is on 15, 59. And so you'll recognize right away we have a lot of the different the same variables like split with chance split that chance split repeat chance a split where but you'll notice like now it's like we're not talking about roads anymore we're talking about plots and so you want these like these like the kind of like the plots that the buildings will sit on to be of a certain size so you don't want it to be too small where the plot is like extremely extremely small and like it's like why would a building ever exist on that plot but you don't want them to be too big necessarily where they're taking up um, like a whole city block in some uh, regard. So here we'll, you know, we have this range that they fit and you'll see agri-industrial and that kind of use the same, but you'll also see uh, different chances for like, what's the chance of it splitting width or splitting depth. And this was just like kind of trial and error of trying different uh, things. So like a traditional city has some repetition to it. Like there's some buildings that are, you know, recognizable but it's not like every single building um, kind of looks the same versus like we have a, one that's called um, Pete repeat, which we want to be like repeat a bunch. And so every, like you kind of have this 0.3% chance, which is much higher uh, than like anything else in the, in the thing. Oh yeah. Agri-industrial also has a really high one just because it like agri-industrial, like, industrial spaces in cities are very like have a lot of repetition uh mm -hmm. to like you know if you're looking at a cornfield a cornfield has a lot of roads or a railroad um or even like a lot of industrial buildings are similar and then now we're going to go to like specific buildings so we've now we've decided our plots now we're going to build the um like we're going to build the different buildings on those uh like on those plots and then to do that you'll see the kind of like a similar thing where it's like you have the again like what you've seen before then you have some new stuff like create level chance like what's the chance that it will create another level above um like the current like when you're building a building up if there's space if you're looking at a traditional one, like it's going to build always build on top of itself versus if like an ag like uh, like if you look at like bigger and center, like as you go out from the center, it'll like there will be less And that's what D is. D is like distance to a rectangle, which was an interesting like if you take a point what's the distance to a rectangle. So you want to figure out the center of the city to like whatever building's base you're looking at. And you want to figure out like, how far am I from the center? Because the farther you are from the center, when you're looking at, let's say like Houston, as you get away from the city center, the building regulation, well not Houston, because Houston has no building regulation, but like Tampa, as you go from the, the downtown area, it will start to, you know, go off and the buildings will be shorter. And you'll, as you get to the suburbs, so that's what we're trying to emulate here with create level chance is like 
the buildings kind of get uh, have less levels and stories um, to them. Yeah, and then lastly, we have the building height generator, which kind of pairs with that building uh, like split, like the building level generator to ultimately uh, like kind of control the height of the building. Uh, so you'll have, you see again here, there's something going like, okay, distance to the center of the city, this is influencing like how high um, the building can be, what the height multiplier is. So you'll have some cities like the traditional one, like we, we don't care about suburbs. So we're like just being like, okay, like get a random height um, it, from like at this max to this min versus like <clears throat> the bigger in center cities and the smaller in center cities, which are the craters. If you're looking at the, the features, like that's when we start to try to influence it like one way or the other. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to look at some of these uh, like examples of them, and then we'll try to apply some of those principles in, uh, in practice. Yeah. So this one, I believe, is a traditional city. Yep. Traditional. Yeah. So you can see like it's the height is like pretty consistent throughout in any like play on that is like by happenstance, which is kind of how cities work. It's like there will be areas that will there will be like influence of like certain zoning regulation and stuff. But this is kind of like more of like a New York, like in Manhattan, you'll just have like, oh, what was it in the past? Um, and this just ha so happened to be like an industrial, like a more industrial part of the city. And this is shorter. Or these are taller. Um, so this is kind of playing off of that is like the the buildings are kind of deciding their own rules um, based on, you know, their like just randomness. Yeah. This is an awesome one. We, I think we. this is probably like one of our favorite types yeah. or at least mine. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so this plays heavily, like I said, off of Tampa, um, <clears throat> Houston, Dallas, like these cities that are very, that have a downtown area and it just drops off super hard. And a lot of that is due to zoning regulation. Um, you know, zoning regulation in cities like San Francisco uh, really has these dense downtown areas, but then you can only have single family homes like right after you get out of that downtown area. So here we're trying to make commentary on that and play that rule system where it's like you have this clump and then every it's like crazy to look at where it's like these buildings on the edge are so tiny. You can see they're like this tiny. And then you have this downtown area that just like is super uh, foreboding. And one thing I do want to comment on um, that we didn't really touch on in the other place is you have these like step backs. You see how this building, like as it goes up, like backs up a little bit on each level. That's also playing off of zoning regulation in New York City in the 19, I think 1920s, 1930s, mm -hmm. uh, that they wanted there to be sunlight that reached the sidewalk. So they had like this step back rule where it's like, okay, every time, you know, every time you like as the building gets taller, you have to do these step backs. So that's how you got like the Empire State Building which is a, you know, a very famous, um, like Art Deco um, building was based off of that uh, step back principle. And then you have greater cities, which is what you saw in the code as smaller in center. So this is kind of the flip <clears throat> of the bigger in center. Um, these actually took a long time because of that distance to rectangle function that we kind of showed earlier, like just getting the math of like a point to a rectangle sounds really easy, but like we kind of started with, oh, you know, point to like the corners. And then we're like, oh no, you get like these really weird artifacts of like the city isn't splitting the buildings correctly. Like mm -hmm. the buildings would be super, super long across the whole piece because those corners are really far, far away from the center. Then we're like, oh, let's do the midpoint. Then the mid, but then you have the opposite issue where it's like the midpoints can be like really, um, like it doesn't work out right. They're like really mm -hmm. close. Um, so then you have, you we had to do like distance to the closest side of a rectangle and that's when this finally worked and you see another thing in here which is like there's even stuff we're not necessarily touching on in the code like this highway that splits all the way through so this is like during that street generation we didn't show you there's like different size streets and then if a street is big enough there's a chance it has a highway um, through the center and this kind of touches on um like robert moses uh who was um i guess like a in charge of building in the uh, New York City that at one point they said he was like more powerful than the mayor 
And he was famous for, um, I think it was through the Bronx. Uh, he put like a highway and displaced a lot of people. So we're doing like a little bit of commentary on like these, these the highways that are just going like through the middle of like these giant um, cities. Mm-hmm. I, I think one of the things that's pretty neat is that pretty much each city type or biome, you might see it, it's called a biome in the code. Each one tells a different story. So like this one, for example, especially um, the crater cities that are flooded, um, the story is that there was some big um, disastrous event, like it was hit by an asteroid or there was an explosion or something. Um, and you can see like this area is people are just starting to rebuild it, but it hasn't um, it hasn't been able to like get back to its prime and flourish the way all of the buildings surrounding it are. So the people in, in these these buildings over here, they, they're kind of like looking down on what's going on around here and maybe staying out of it or maybe thinking like I have to get back home from work today and help rebuild my neighbor's house or something like that. Yeah. I think it could also be viewed as like slums and you can kind of relate this to um, a lot of this reminds me of Billionaire's Row, which is this row in New York City where you have these super tall, super thin skyscrapers that are casting shadows over Central Park. And there's like a lot of, um, you know, kind of, in the government and just people like these are these billionaire apartments that are only like 10 percent occupied uh that are you know investments mostly for people overseas and it's casting shadows on like a public place um or you know that everyone can use so this kind of shows this a little bit where you have these big buildings that especially you see with like the sun i think this is a sunset like it's casting shadows here onto the the people that are just starting um mm-hmm. to rebuild yeah, and then lastly, we have the monolith. I think this is another one that we, it's its super unique in the overall set. Yeah, I would say. Yeah, monolith was basically um, a mathematical experimentation to, to see like, all right, we have the, the algorithm, we have the ability to change the configuration. Let's see sort of what kind of funky stuff we can do to push this algorithm and create something that we haven't thought of. So we dropped the, the split chances super low in pretty much every place for monolith so we're not getting streets that are dividing the city we have this one monolithic uh structure that's sort of like a a super city um i think to me monolith looks a lot more like a city floating in the sky um whereas some of the other ones like a traditional city for example it's on this this pedestal and it's like um sort of a display piece but it, it looks more like a real city. Um, whereas to me, monolith is kind of like a cartoonish um, exaggeration of, of a city yeah. where it's like some, some crazy industrial factory that's like taking over the entire city or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like this, it's kind of like, a, you could view it as like a f- city of the future, kind of like this Judge Dredd, like mega city <clears throat> that you like walk into when you're like indoors forever, mm-hmm. essentially. Or you could view it as like a, a study on like a single building, which, you know, mm-hmm. that, like, let's say this is a single building, you have these smokestacks here, like maybe like a more industrial production center over in the corner. And these are all kind of like part of this one building, like Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's, it's super, like what I really love about these different biome types. And, and one thing I'd love to see more people do is like take a seat with these, um, these different biotypes and try to tell a story about why these different, ext- these structures exist. And I, that's the most fun I've had with these pieces is like mm-hmm. sitting down and, and trying to understand like the algorithm. Like this one is like, there is no, sp- street split chance so the streets never appear then the plots never appear so like this is one building so we're saying no streets no plots this is one building it then goes to create that one building and we say if you're on your first iteration like don't split the individual levels of the building like keep them consistent so that's how you see as it goes up we give it more leeway to then Mm -hmm. split more so as it goes up, that's when you see like these these big pillars and then it splits at the end and says like, I'm done. So you kind of get this like this cap at the top where it like multiple colors and multiple um, like patterns and repeating and stuff like that. So there's a lot of different influences here. So if you go through the code, um, which I'd love if you did, like we try to make it easy for you to try to understand the split chances by if you control F and be like traditional or monolith, you'll see all the different rule sets for all the different things that we've talked about today. Mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah, I believe. Oh, oh yes. Okay. Here and we this have is the chaos. Chaos. <laughs> <laughs> so this is sort of what I was talking about, where all of the the split, um, all of the splits can happen in so many different places. So you can see, like, there's really no patterns here. There's there's little streets all over the place. There's there's no like there was no plan. Uh, that went into creating this city. Like there's these giant buildings right next to, sorry, right next to small houses right over here. Um, there's these super long, maybe warehouses or however you want to see them, um, just sort of placed randomly. And if you look at the top, it's the layout is crazy. Um, and then if you compare it to like a traditional city, this makes a, a lot more sense. Um, it's It's split pretty evenly into similarly sized uh, squares or rectangles. Yeah, it's like, it's, and this is like, we're trying to lean into randomness here. I think we, what we really enjoy about generative art is the fact that it's so, like there is this sense of randomness to it, like something no one would ever think of. So although we're playing with these rule sets and we're trying to make them conform, there's something really exciting about like telling the algorithm, you split when you want, like you, um, you know, you build the buildings where you want to build them. Like you make them as high as you want within like the general rule set of like, this thing has to be able to support itself. And then that's when you get like chaos stuff like this. So this is kind of expressing that, like maybe these aren't the most visually appealing because there's not a lot of pattern, but it's more like this sense of story versus a sense of uh, rhythm and aesthetics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that sort of leans back into uh, what I said earlier with Empyrean, how it's just this complete randomness. And then we we built this this nice, like very rigid system. And then we said, all right, how do we break that system? How do we how do we give it the power to do anything it wants? And leaning back into that sort of pure randomness where we started with Empyrean. Exactly. So it like tells this like circular story and like, you know, this was back in what September? was when we released yeah, Democracy think, City. Yeah. Like this was really like, I feel like a cap for our like projects on art blocks. And it's been interesting trying to think of like a next <clears> one. <throat> yeah. Because it's like, this tells such a cohesive story, kind of like Gen 1, Gen 2, Gen 3 in a way. Yeah. Like I love that story. Yeah. So for this, this is our personal like Gen 1, Gen 2, Gen 3. Yeah, definitely. And we've kind of like, now it's like, we're trying to think of what, what, you know, story is good in like the current ecosystem of like art blocks and generative art. Yeah. Like, generally, so. That's where we're at. <laughs> but now, like, I think, you know, Stephen, you're probably excited to talk about this next thing because it's, <laughs> it's a whole different generative project. Yeah. So so basically, when we worked on Democracy, we had two projects going on at once. One was the city creation and the, the building creation, everything we just discussed. And then we had basically this entirely separate project, uh, which was the weather system. And neither of us have really done anything like that before. Um, and it was it was a very different approach than how we would normally do our projects. There was there was a lot of physics involved, a lot of ensuring that timing was correct with certain things, because we wanted it to look realistic. We we wanted it to be obviously the the colors are crazy saturated and it's it's over exaggerated, but we wanted the weather to look like as realistic as we as it could given the constraints of the system that we're working in. So. To get started with the weather, um, we have this one here, which is just a crazy output. Um, this is one of the tallest buildings, maybe the tallest, <laughs> I think. I think it's, it is. It's pretty crazy. Yeah, Steven showed me this today, and I was like, I didn't know we had buildings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, this one's pretty crazy, but I think this is a good example to get started with the weather system, because you can see here we have the ring cloud type, which is... Um, uh, we have a few different cloud types. I think this one really stands out. Like it's it's very noticeable when you see it, and it really highlights this massive building in the center, which is super cool for this one. Um, we also have a thunderstorm going on in this one, where you could see this flashing, and um, that was another thing that was just totally new to us, and we had to do a lot of fine tuning and experimenting to figure out what looks realistic and not just have the whole screen flash like in crazy ways. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's pretty neat is that the flashes come from locations where there's clouds. So like you won't see flashing on the top of this bit. Well, you can see it coming up to the top, but it, it won't start at the top of the building and go down. It, it's, it's like dependent on the clouds. Mm -hmm. um, 
And then one of the other things that's pretty crazy about this one, it's a really crazy combination, is that this one has acid rain. Um, so if, if a piece has rain, there's a very small chance that it can get acid rain. Um, so we can only have acid rain if the algorithm already decided there will be rain. Um, and acid rain is just rather than using the, um, we use like a, a very light, mostly transparent blue color for regular rain. For acid rain, you choose one of the colors from the building color palette. Um, so you could see here, um, I hope you can see this on the stream uh, or on the recording. Uh, we have the same color as these blue buildings for the rain droplets. And maybe if I change this oh, yeah. now in, in this mode, the, the droplets are huge. You can really see that blue color uh, coming through. So um, overall in, in the weather system, there's a lot of different things that can that can happen. And the hard part for us was figuring out realistic ways to have all of these things interacting together. Um, so. I guess uh, we can jump into the code for that. One of the first things is the, the cloud types. Um, so this is sort of similar to how we, we organized the city generation is that we have um, these different functions that we pass around based on the configuration that was selected for the given piece. Um, so in this case, we have the cloud fall off, which decides where we're going to place the clouds and um, like sort of where it's going to start, where it's going to end. Um, so if we go back to the ring, you can see obviously there's no clouds in the center and then they fall off around the edge of the circle. Um, but it's it's not a perfect circle because we wanted, to, wanted it to be sort of realistic looking, like clouds aren't mm -hmm. perfect. Um, we wanted it to be sort of an organic form, but built out of these little tiny blocks to fit in with the constraints of this entire blocky system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's made of like little voxels, if you've yeah. ever seen like crypto crypto voxels, mm -hmm. like has them, but it's like also just this thing that was used a lot, um, like in different games and stuff. So mm -hmm. and that was one of the things actually we we took a lot of inspiration from Minecraft for Democracy, just because there's a lot of things it does really well, um, mm -hmm. and sort of this like blocky voxel art was new to us at the time. And we kept just going back to Minecraft, like, <laughs> how did they get this done so well? Uh, let's study that and figure out how we can implement something similar. So yeah, we, we have realistic looking clouds in this block system. Yeah, we did do the clouds very different than Minecraft. Like we wanted right. something that was, you know, made of these, like, like in the way Minecraft does like these cloud maps is they have like a texture and that it's the same texture, just like repeated over and over again in the clouds. So you can actually tell position in Minecraft by where the clouds are at at what time, which is super interesting. Like fun fact, but like <laughs> that is not what we did here. Like right. we had to build these from the ground up using um, like different types of noise mm -hmm. um, paired with the system <clears throat> for um, doing a occlusion, so that you have you build with blocks, but then the blocks disable like some of their sides depending on um, like their neighbor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's like one of the neat things about this project is that we learned so much along the way and we tried to do a bunch of things in a bunch of different ways before we got it right. And um, I think that's just like super helpful for us in the long run because we've experimented with so many different methods for the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's just like, you know, learning more as you go is, is always helpful. And I think this project was a massive learning experience. Yeah, massive stress and <laughs> learning experience. Yeah. I, I don't want to have learning experiences like this again. <laughs> it was ton of, tons of fun. And I think now if we were to do it again, we'd, we'd have so many more different ideas just from what yeah. we've learned even since. Yeah, so it's it's cool to look back at this piece like today and look like we were looking at the code before we started this and trying to understand <laughs> why we did X or why we did Y. And I think yeah. we found some places where it's like, couldn't we just delete this? You yeah, know? Like, yeah. <laughs> this didn't need to be here. Yeah, but sometimes you get lost in the sauce <laughs> when you get this deep in a project. And that's totally. okay. That's part of the fun. Um, so anyway, the, the, the next thing for uh, what we wanted to cover here is in the weather system. So we have this decide weather function here. Um, and it's, it's, again, it's just the same, uh, deciding on a configuration. So we have, um, low bounds and high bounds, um, for, I think this is for the, the cloud, right? Yeah. So this is the cloud coverage where it's yeah. like it, in noise, like noise gives you a value from zero to one. 
So we're picking like a low bound and a high bound in that noise and we'll only display block like blocks that are in that like lower and high bound. Mm -hmm. So low crowd coverage is going to be like, you know, very small here. You see it's 0 0.02 versus like higher. Like once you start to get higher cloud coverage, you see 0.4 to 0.5 and then even 0.4 to 0.6. So you mm -hmm. have like these wider ranges. So you still get blocks that don't appear because you want that texture. Um, but, you know, you're not. You, so it's like you're playing, you play that game. Yep. Um, yeah, and then we also have the cloud layers, which, uh, so basically the way this is organized is like no clouds, some clouds, but I guess medium clouds and mm -hmm. a ton of clouds. So that's why these values are going up and you can see the cloud layers. Um, we're, we're choosing a, a, a random number from a range, but that range is getting higher overall um, as we go into more and more clouds. Yeah. So the, the cloud layers are, are like um, how these, how the blocks are stocked. Uh, Stack. Stacked on top of each other. Thanks. Um, yeah. So like it's, you can see like from the code, like there's this, like a, one that's super high cloud coverage could technically have less layers than one that's medium mm -hmm. cloud coverage, but it's going to have more clouds overall. So we're trying to play this game of like, how could these system, or, like how do these systems work in real life? Mm -hmm. Like you could have like thin clouds, but more cloud coverage like overall. So we're trying to really lean into like, and you'll see once we get to like snow and ground coverage, like these systems interact in a lot of different ways. Right. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess probably the, the last part of that here is whether it should rain. So within each um, different cloud type, when the, um, there's a small chance or there's some chance that it could rain. Um, and like, for example, this one, there, it's, it's almost guaranteed to be raining. Like there's a 5% chance of it not raining, as, assuming we're already in this category. Um, and this is also the only time we can get lightning. Um, this is the overcast, I believe we called it. Um, so um, that's the only time we can get a thunderstorm. Yeah, totally. Um, so next, do you wanna talk about the rain timing? Um, yeah, we can quickly touch on this. So rain timing was interesting because there's this distribution. When you lay out the rain to begin with, you need to, if you do a normal distribution uh, where you randomly place rain all over the points, since like rain, when it falls, accelerates, you'll actually, when the, we tried to make a loop where it's like you can loop democracies uh, infinitely. Mm -hmm. uh, and like, so you can take gifts of them and display them on screens. So we had to do this like time elapse to make sure it could be looped. And but like when you did that loop, because the, it was a normal distribution, it would there would be layers like it would, they would all fall and it would like then you'd notice there's like a whole really thick layer of rain. So we actually had to I wanted to I tried to get my our physics major friend to like to help us like figure out how rain should be distributed over like a, a 3D space and they never came through. So I eventually had to talk to. Alex Saltstein, who's an engineer at Artblocks, before he was an engineer at Artblocks, and I just like talked to him about it for a while, and he sat there quietly, and I eventually figured it out. <laughs> um, called rubber ducky program uh, programming if, or debugging, if you look it up. Yeah. So we're going to quickly touch on. Uh, we're running out of time, <clears throat> so we're going to have to quickly yeah. touch on ground coverage, uh, yep. and then we'll get to uh, questions. Yeah. So um, let's see. It's just a fog. Oh yeah, that's like a square. This is like oh, the square right. clouds. Um, an example of that. Yep. Um, all right. So now, now we have ground coverage. Um, so we wanted to, one of the things we wanted to do in this project is like touch on sort of natural disasters and stuff, which I explained earlier with the crater city. Um, but like we have flooding in the city. Um, and one of the things I think is neat about this pretty quick is that we kind of gave it like an epoxy table or decoration look, mm -hmm. um, which was just like, we wanted to avoid clipping, but it, we ended up really liking the look of it where the flood is not coming all the way to the edge. There's a small gap where the buildings stick out around there. Um, but for the floods, there, there's a bunch of different events that can happen. And the way the, the weather interacts is you can have a flood with rain. You can have a flood without rain. You can have a frozen flood where, um, where it rained and then it got cold and the, the flood hadn't cleared yet. So the whole city is frozen under ice. Yeah. 
it's pretty much any interaction you can think of like snow with like flood without yeah. like it's not cold enough like it's you could even say there's like a temper a little bit of a temperature system yes in in democracy so it's like whether whether it's raining or not but it's also like temperature so it's it's it was super fun to explore yeah and then so here we have an example of a frozen flood where you can see it's it's not so transparent it's a little bit harder to see through um which for this piece makes it incredibly bright um also with the the lighting i think this is probably a flat lighting piece mm -hmm. um but this is a, a frozen flood um but it's it's not snowing in this one it's not raining in or anything like that so this is like a past event and now we're seeing the aftermath of that in the city yeah um but now here we have um a frozen flood and um with snow coverage on top of it um so this is just another example of like one of those things where we had to think of every possibility and and make sure we had it all covered because it wouldn't make sense for it to be snowing here and not have snow on top of the ice. Um, so you could see some of the buildings are covered with snow and the entire flood is covered with snow. Um, okay. Yeah. Oh, and then I think, I don't know if we showed an example, but you can also have a frozen flood with snow coverage, but it's not actively snowing. Mm -hmm. um, because that was another past event that happened and we're looking at the aftermath. And then lastly, just to show here, um, you can have snow without it snowing and there's no frozen flood. So the whole city is covered in snow. This, this major street here, I think that's a street. Yeah. yeah. This major street here is covered in snow and a lot of the buildings are, but it's not actively snowing. Um, so overall we, what we want to do is just think of every possibility for the weather system and how all these <laughs> things interact. So yeah. The, the clouds, um, like the temperature, whether it's precipitating, um, whether there was a flood, how that affect, uh, affects different city types and the height of the flood and things like that. Yeah, it's <laughs> a lot of different things. There's a lot of problems where it's like snow is under the water and, yeah. or snow is like just barely above the water and then it causes like clipping and all this yeah. stuff. So there's a lot of refining over time. But yeah. that's, yeah, that's the overview. We're ready for uh, questions, Pompey. Awesome. Um, I mean, first off, I'm very impressed by the attention to detail in these outputs, um, especially when it comes to the buildings and the, the weather interactions. Um, I mean, <laughs> actually putting in the time to make sure that snow can land on top of the frozen, uh, the frozen flood's pretty crazy. Um, <laughs> I, I have a, a handful of questions from the community. Um, the first being from LJ. What are some of the interesting combinations of traits that came out in Democracy? Oh man. Yeah. Like democracy was like an eight month grind. So it was like that it was such a, like it was to the point where it's like, we knew everything that was going to come out and we yeah. had to know everything that was going to come out because it had to be, you know, a, a, you know, a thousand outputs. And when a city looks super off, a city looks super off. So you really like, we love randomness and we love when stuff does really unexpected stuff, but there's also, we need to be super specific, but I love like these, mm -hmm. like where it's this float frozen flood with the snow on top, like how it obscures so many buildings under the water. Uh, well, in the like frozen water, it's, you know, you just have this and the, the thumbnails, like the way the thumbnails come out, it's just like you're zoomed in and it's just like, it, it's Zen in a yeah. way. And yeah. these are really, I think give a really <clears throat> special feeling. Yeah. Um, and they're really rare on the set. Like people really love lightning. I think mm -hmm. you remember that, yeah. Stephen. And per, like, I never thought people would like lightning that much. I thought people yeah. were really going to like these, but I think a lot of people don't even know these exist in the set, and that might be part of it. Yeah, and I, I think it's hard to really understand. Like, obviously, we know it's so much better because we wrote the code. Like, we were really deep in this for a long time. Yeah. But it's it's hard to look at this whole set of a thousand pieces and like understand every little combination unless you really study it. Yeah, it's like this is like four layers deep. It's like temperature, <laughs> snow, like it was flood, it was flooded, then the flood <laughs> froze, and then the flood froze, and it can have snow on top. So there's the, like all these if statements in the code that are yeah. like, this is possible, and we ha really had to make sure, like, okay, this is not going to fail in this way, mm -hmm. where the flood does like wasn't fl frozen, and then snow gets on top of it because that makes no sense. Right. So it's like, like you said, Pompeii, it's like we had to have this real attention to detail, and this. Uh, really kind of shows that um and yeah. what in what makes it really interesting yeah i think one of my favorite things is the crater cities with the flood because mm -hmm. like, oh yeah 
you can just see it's so disastrous there that they, <laughs> they got double uh just like destroyed yeah and double it, whammy it, yeah it's like that like global really warming like yeah. global warming and like uh, asteroid or you right. know some dystopian yeah. <laughs> piece yeah yeah i mean these remind me uh when you're talking about it like uh Day after tomorrow, where like New York yeah. gets oh, frozen that, over, like the water hits and then gets frozen. That yeah, was one of my exactly. favorite movies growing up. Was de- the day after tomorrow? <laughs> it's probably <laughs> a little bit in here. Um, and so LJ has uh, another question. Uh, what went into deciding the building structures and various little things in a mint? And, and you kind of touched upon that. And I wanted to add to that too: is how much time do you spend studying architecture and urban layouts, or did you already have an interest in this previously? That's that's Alex's like, number one passion. He talks about it nonstop. <laughs> yeah, you can't you can't catch me not talking about it when it comes to like our art because people always have like I guess ask us individually like what really got us into generative art and and for me it it harpens back to like I wanted to be an architect um, and instead like I played a lot of Minecraft, ran Minecraft servers, and loved the building aspect of it, but I also loved the programming aspect to it. Um, so I ended up pursuing that programming passion. Uh, but there's, I've always had, you know, I grew up talking with my father who also wanted to be an architect and ended up going to computer science just about, you know, Art Deco and Frank Lloyd Wright and the Blarg Ingalls group, uh, Frank Gehry, like all these different, very famous architects and different eras of architecture. Um, so, and then I moved to New York City to go to school. And so it's, I've just been, I love staring at buildings and a lot of people walk and they're looking down and looking at the ground. I always try to look up. Because there's a, and my dad always said that. So it's like, I always try to notice, you know, gargoyles and the, the way the building is put together. So this is like that culmination of like all those random studies. Um, so this was a big like journey for me is what I want to do mm-hmm. uh, a bit with generative art. And, you know, Stephen really helped, um, I guess, facilitate that vision and even added like a lot of his own like observations. Yeah. Well, one of my early ideas for this project was to not just do cities like a the reason the different city types are called biomes is because we wanted to do like uh, cities and deserts and forests. And that was something I was really interested in. Like I love nature and like just learning about different ecosystems and things like that. Um, so that was sort of where like the, the short cities came in where like, like smaller structures in a, a less built up uh, environment and things like that. So that was one of the things that I wanted to add in here. And it ended up becoming all different city types, which is cool because it just evolved into that naturally. Um, but the original goal was like different ecosystems. Yeah, maybe one day. <laughs> but yeah, that type of procedural generation is amazing. So yeah. we're definitely, you know, trying, that we, <laughs> learning the skills to do things like that. Yeah. Do you have any interest in uh, potentially actually designing a, a real building? Oh, I, I, I like there's actually a, like a field called, um, well, not a field. It's like a, a flavor of, I guess, generative art or just the study of like generative systems is generative architecture. And so if you look around, you'll find um, I think it's um, oh, what's her name? She did a building in right next to the High Line in New York City. Um, I, I'm sorry, it, it's escaping me, but like they use uh, systems for generative um, like architecture and, and form. So there's there's people doing it and we'd eventually, we'd love to participate in some way or another. And I think there are artists on Artblox who have done uh, some semblance of, you know, different metal grates and stuff that you consider like architectural pieces with generative algorithms. So if someone approached us and was like, hey, you want to do like this, uh, the facade of this building? I don't think we'd say no, <laughs> but not like a building. That would be incredible. Not, not, uh, that type of engineer <laughs> is it uh is it zaha hadid yes yeah, zaha hadid doing? exactly yeah. yeah so they that like their practice uses a lot of these um these techniques awesome uh we have two more one from uh brixton what are some of the technical challenges faced when implementing some of the main features for example custom camera rotation oh yeah oh yeah we, we actually didn't really even discuss the camera much so we, we have two different camera types which was um, not like, not incredibly difficult, but we wanted to like really pay attention to the detail and, and not make it so you, like you feel nauseous from one camera type or anything <laughs> like that. You know, like we had to get it right. We had to get it so you could really explore. So maybe if I like go to this one, um, one of the things we wanted to do was I wanted to call it an explorer mode where you can actually drop down into the city and walk around. 
we decided not to implement collision detection um, because that was just a, a really big thing to implement. And we felt that this project didn't need it. And that's, you know, that's that would serve another project better than this one. Um, but definitely the camera types, what, what we wanted to do is make sure it was like accurate and mm -hmm. it looks like you're looking at a city. Um, and we yeah. wanted it to be like, uh, you know, two different types of views on the city. And so you can really explore however you want. Um, and there's different challenges like to that, like different systems in 3JS, which is what this is built in, depending on the camera type, will interact differently. Mm -hmm. uh, like that, how big the rain is and like just the way uh, occ like occlusion works or the way shadows work depends on the camera type. Um, so there was like a lot of us trying to make the camera, like both cameras feel the same. And it's such mm -hmm. a small feature, yeah. but it, we probably spent like weeks. Yeah. We should have just deleted the second camera <laughs> at some point, to be honest. But like, this is uh, it, like having this explore mode, like this isometric, which is like this high level satellite view, and then being able to really come close and explore individual buildings was uh, like a story we wanted to tell. Mm -hmm. And that goes into the thumbnails, which everyone talks uh, harasses us about but like <laughs> yeah. that's uh that's kind of you know the overview there yeah and i i think probably just one of the other main things is there's clipping non-stop when you're working with in a 3d environment like mm -hmm. this so i think the flood um the flood and snow gave us probably the most trouble with clipping making sure the heights were correct on everything so when you put one shape on top of another if you don't do it just right it's going to look different at every single angle so we had to make sure all of that was super clean and consistent mm -hmm. I was gonna say, I feel like I've seen that in some, like the examples of clipping in some uh, like low grade video games, you, you kind of turn a corner yep. and things like tweak out on screen. Yeah, um, like shadows are another thing. Like the study of even doing 3D shadows, that was like a month and a half here. Yeah. And there's like trade off <laughs> the shadow generation. I don't even want to get into it, but yeah, if you want like what we spent the most time on for the simplest thing, it was shadows. shadows yeah, Fog too was a big one. Mm -hmm. We ended up not, um, implementing fog the way we originally wanted to just because it was very difficult technically and we couldn't really figure it out yeah. at the time this is I, before we really knew glsl as well so yeah. it's like this was like a whole you know that was like what you cross a barrier once you walk into glsl land and yeah <laughs> another example of the attention to detail was uh that i was pretty blown away by was the the lightning especially went for the tall buildings how the light wasn't as you said showing down from the top it was actually like showing up the building which i mean is how it would be in nature right um mm -hmm. and, and like real life and you actually pay attention to that so i have one more question it's from uh jimbo 3816 um if each of you were to be forever trapped in one democracy city which would you choose <laughs> oh, man <laughs> i love jimbo <laughs> <laughs> we went to we met him in I believe New York City, right? Yeah, and we were there um, and oh. like some some party. We hung out all night. Yeah, <laughs> and he, he was talking about democracy to everyone. Yeah. So love this question from him. Do you have um, one, Stephen? I don't have a, a specific um, token ID that I would choose, but I would definitely choose agrodustrial. Um, I, it just seems like so relaxing to me compared to <laughs> like the, the crazy like giant center cities or like the crater city where you don't know what's going on. Agrodustrial is like clean and consistent. It's got farms, it's got warehouses, it's got a couple highways and that's it. <laughs> it's, it's simple and peaceful. And that's, that's sort of like, I actually just moved out um, to a more rural area myself. So I'm sort of living the agrodustrial life. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, for me, it's it would probably be the traditional cities. Like I grew up in Tampa, which is what kind of inspired like those center cities where it's like everything's you have these huge skyscrapers downtown and that's where there's a lot of activity. But you move to the suburbs and the suburbs come in very quick and then you have to drive everywhere. So I really like cities where I can move. And so that's why and use public transit. And like I, I'm at Stevens House, which is two and a half hours away by train, but which is a lot, but it's also like in Tampa, there's no train. You need to own a car. Yeah. So like yeah. being able to do that transport. So like probably like a traditional city, like New York City, like as close to that is like definitely the what the cities I would I would go with <laughs> if I was to live in a democracy. Awesome. No, uh, yeah, I love that question. Um, that's all I have from uh, the community. Um, I just want to say, you know, 
thanks guys for coming on and preparing this presentation. I mean, it was very insightful and I feel like it adds a lot to the, the project and, uh, and the creators behind it. Um, I want to thank everybody who uh, is going to be watching this later. And on the next episode, uh, we'll have artist Wuwa joining us to speak on his uh, premium series. Till then, be great and happy minting. Yeah, thanks for having us. This was fantastic. Thank you. And thanks for everyone who's going to watch this. Awesome. See ya. Bye. Take care.